Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so welcome to the GWF Aquatic uh, Ec Ecology uh, session. Uh, my name is Yonggi Kim from McMaster University and I will be chairing uh, this session. Uh, in this session, we have seven speakers and each speaker uh, will be given uh, nine minutes of presentation and one minute for questions. So I'm going to send their, uh, what is that uh, kind of message uh, on the chat box uh, to the speaker at around eight minutes. So if you see my message, yeah, please be prepared for finishing uh, your presentation. And for audience, uh, uh, if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to type your question on the chat box. Then I will uh, go over the questions at the end of each presentation. So uh, our uh, first speaker is uh, Jennifer Lento. And Jennifer is going to talk about understanding environmental flow needs in the Saskatchewan River uh, Basin. So Jennifer, please, the flow is yours. Please share your screen and then start your presentation. Uh, sure, it's just saying the host has disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> oh. I am not the host, but let me try to find a way <laughs> to make your co-host. Let me see. I don't think I, I can, can make request. Host. I think host is AV support. Yeah, AV support. Can you set it up so that we can share? Yeah. Okay, I was told that everyone is a, would be able to share this screen, but let me. Oh, I can share now. We're good. Okay, great. Great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Sorry for the <laughs> little technical difficulties there. Um, I'm Jen Lento, and I'm going to be presenting today on some work that's part of the Integrated Modeling Program for Canada. And I'm specifically going to talk about ecological implications of some of the modeling results from that program. And I'd like to acknowledge all of my co-authors uh, who are contributing to this ongoing work. So this research is focused on environmental flows, which describe the quantity, timing, and quality of freshwater flows that are required in order to sustain aquatic ecosystems, as well as to sustain the uh, ecosystem services that they provide. So this plot that's on the right here is showing some of the different components of flow, where we have things such as the uh, magnitude, timing, duration, and frequency of floods and droughts. And all of these have important implications for community structure and function. For example, organisms may rely on the timing of, of high flows as a dispersal trigger or uh, to, uh, you know, as a, as a trigger for things like recruitment. So when we have alteration of flows through uh, water withdrawal or through abstraction, this can disrupt life history of organisms that are living within the system. And it can disrupt ecosystem function as, as a result of that. So what we're trying to do with this work is try to understand the potential impacts of flow alteration on these different environmental flow components and to try and define what are the flow needs for the system. We're doing this work in Saskatchewan River Basin, which is shown here in this map, and we're focusing on 33 gauges within the basin, uh, which are marked here on this map in yellow. Uh, and these, these points uh, cover areas of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Um, we're looking at measured flow data from 1979 to 2010 for all of these gauges. And then we also have naturalized flow data for the same period that have been modeled through MESH. And these naturalized flow data describe the flows in the absence of any human alteration. So it describes those flows you would expect to have if we, if we didn't have any sort of impacts. Let's go. Um, and we're looking here at uh, the median of 15 different climate scenarios. Uh, 
that, that's what I'll be showing you today in terms of the data. Um, there are also future flows, but I'm going to be focusing today on the naturalized flows for this time period of 1979 to 2010, and I'm going to be showing you the differences um, between the measured and naturalized flows, which can allow us to get a sense of um, those changes to those environmental flow components that have happened because of, of different uh, alterations to flows. So the first thing I'm going to show you is a comparison of uh, hydrographs for measured flows in these systems, as well as those modeled naturalized flows. And I've done this with uh, runoff instead of discharge because we're just going to um, uh, standardize a bit based on upstream catchment area for these sites. So this is going to be for a subset of, of the sites within the basin. Um, and what you'll see is uh, a median hydrograph across that time period uh, showing the flows throughout the year. So the, uh, the orange curves, that's the measured flows, whereas the blue is the naturalized. Um, and so we're moving from uh, upstream to downstream, and there's a few things to notice here. One is that where we have uh, southern parts of the basin where there's some agriculture, we can see that in uh, the summer period, we start to see measured flows that are below those naturalized flows. So below what we would expect to see because of water withdrawals for agriculture. In other areas where we have a lot of effects of dams, what we start to see is higher flows in, in winter. Uh, than what we would expect to see, higher than those naturalized flows. Uh, this is, for example, is a location just below uh, the Brazo, uh, Brazo uh, uh, Dam. And you can see that the spring peak is a bit lower, the winter flows are higher, so it contributes to sort of a flattening of this hydrograph. And as we move further and further downstream, um, getting to some of these uh, points where we're in uh, uh, eastern Saskatchewan and in Manitoba, you can see that the measured hydrograph is essentially quite flat. We even have some winter flows that are, that are higher than the summer flows. So this is not at all what we expect to see when we think about typical hydrograph. We're losing that seasonality of the spring peak, um, and it can cause potentially some impacts for organisms that rely on that seasonality for life history traits. Another way of looking at this uh, is to sort of look at the, the deviations from flows in relatively between ice on and ice off periods, just to get a sense of when we see the greatest deviations. So what I'm going to show is a pie chart for each of the gauges. And what you'll see is that the first wedge starting at the top is the deviations, the, the amount of deviations from measured flows during the ice off period. The next one will be the amount during the ice on period. So whichever of these wedges is larger, that tells us during which season we see greater deviations. The color of the wedge is going to tell you whether the flows are, the measured flows are below naturalized when it's orange or whether they're above naturalized when it's blue. So there's a lot of pies here, but we can just sort of look generally at the patterns um, and notice that in the southern part of the basin where we have more agriculture, we see a lot of gauges where we're seeing uh, actual flows that are below those naturalized flows. So below what we would expect to see in the absence of, of human alteration. Um, we do have some cases where it's, it's really strongly during that ice off period that we're seeing those flows that are below uh, below naturalized, which again is reflecting those water withdrawals happening due to agriculture. When we look at some other areas, for example, in the northern part of the basin where we have more of an impact of dams, we don't see as much of an impact of agriculture, we can see that the ice on period is when we have the greatest amount of deviation from naturalized flows, and we're seeing those flows that are above naturalized. So again, we're seeing higher flows in the winter, typical of that dam signal, when there's uh, a more sort of steady release of water throughout the year, rather than seeing our typical low flows in winter, peak in spring, and, and gradually lessening in summer. As we move further downstream, these are really reflective of that flatter hydrograph. We have lower flows than naturalized in the summer, in the in spring, in that whole ice off period. And then we have higher flows than naturalized in the winter, which really dominates the deviations we see. So again, overall getting to that point where it is a much flatter hydrograph. You can also look at these deviations, um, just looking at them moving from downstream on the right to upstream on the left. There's a point for each of the gauges here and they're colored based on which river they're in. And the size of each point is telling us about the upstream catchment area. On the left, we have uh, the measured percent deviation, so the mean percent deviation um, during ice off and the right hand plot is showing the mean deviation during ice on. 
And what we can see uh, with this, this uh, dotted line for reference of the, the zero point is that when we're looking at the ice off period, uh, the upstream smaller catchments where we have uh, agriculture, a lot of these more southern catch, uh, southern gauges, that's where we're seeing measured flows below naturalized. And then downstream in the larger gauges, that's also where we're seeing uh, measured flows below naturalized. When we look at the ice on period, most of them are showing measured flows above naturalized. Again, more reflective of what we start to see with dams. It's really only where we have that higher agriculture signal that we're seeing measured flows below naturalized for ice on. So again, all of this together is reflecting that loss of seasonality. We're not seeing the typical changes that you would occur to see in terms of, uh, you would expect to see in terms of magnitude of flow throughout the year, which can have impacts in terms of dispersal of reproductive triggers and life history. So there's a lot of potential ecological implications for that. And that's where we're going with this next. So what we're going to start doing is uh, looking more at indicators of, of hydrologic alteration metrics, IHA metrics. And what these do is they actually quantify that variation. They'll allow us to quantify that variation between the naturalized and the measured flows in these systems. And the idea then is that we can take these quantities, these, these values that tell us about uh, how much differ uh, differences we have between different um, for the, the different environmental flow components, relate them to the organisms that we're seeing in these systems and try to get a sense of, of what's going on there and how much the organisms might be impacted by the changes we're seeing. And this is an example on the left of environmental flow components across the entire time period uh, for the furthest downstream station where you saw that really flat hydrograph. This is the naturalized condition on the top. So this is what you would expect to see the change throughout the year and across all the years. We expect some years to have higher flows, some years to have lower flows. But on the bottom here is the actual measured uh, hydrograph and environmental flow components over that time period. So you can see it's incredibly different. Visually, it's quite a strong difference. And you can, it reflects this discharge. It reflects the, uh, the pattern that uh, is not at all what we expect to see under those naturalized conditions. So we're gonna keep moving forward with this uh, and quantify this in relation to the biota. Thanks very much <laughs> for that, uh, for everyone listening. And uh, if there's time for questions, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Jennifer. Maybe one quick question from the audience. Yep. Please go ahead. Maybe not a question. Yeah, then yeah, I think there are if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank uh, Jennifer for the nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Mehdi uh, Akidem. And Mehdi is going to talk about understanding how ecosystem interactions drive fish mercury. So Mehdi, uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead and then uh, start your presentation. Mehdi, you're muted. Thank you, I'm mute. Okay, yes, thank you. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen and hear me? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Thank you, thank you very much. So, hi, thanks so much for having me this afternoon. My name is Mehdi and I'm a graduate student at the University of Waterloo working with Dr. Heidi Swanson. I apologize for my voice, I'm just recovering from a cold. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, mercury in fish basically an attempt made to uh, understand how ecosystem interactions drive fish mercury concentrations in subarctic lakes of Canada. Material I'm presenting today is part of my PhD so I would like to take the opportunity and uh, thank anyone who has contributed to the large and collaborative project on which my PhD is based and that includes First Nation communities, funding sources, friends, colleagues and indeed co-authors of the resulting paper. So what is mercury? Mercury is a toxic heavy metal that in elevated concentrations of its organic form, methyl mercury, can pose detrimental health effects on fish, wildlife, and humans. It is released, mercury is released into the environment from both natural and anthropogenic sources. Once in aquatic food webs, it, mercury can be transferred through dietary interactions to a uh, biota at higher trophic levels, including fish and ultimately to humans. 
fish consumption is globally the primary exposure pathways of methylated form of mercury to humans. And that is why it is important to uh, understand uh, drivers of fish mercury concentrations, especially in areas where fish are a critical food source. But fish mercury is a complex phenomenon. It is an outcome of uh, numerous interactions among variables and processes that act at different biological and spatial scales. At the finest scale, mercury can be influenced by uh, organismal variables. Uh, and this is basically or pretty much associated with the uh, bioaccumulation of mercury uh, over time and biomagnification of mercury with each trophic transfer within the aquatic food webs. Uh, basically, this means that fish that grow uh, slower or feed at higher trophic level uh, tend to have more mercury, higher mercury concentrations that, than fish that grow faster or feed at lower level prey items. Uh, fish mercury can also be influenced by ecosystem characteristics and in lakes, this would be in lake and catchment variables such as concentrations of ions, organic matter um, and oxygen in, in lakes or uh, catchment physical attributes such as uh, catchment land cover composition or surface area. For example, in lakes with, high, uh, with low level of oxygen or high level of organic matter, fish tend to have more mercury concentrations because higher mercury concentrations because these uh, conditions uh, promote methylation and biological uptake of mercury. Um, or in lakes whose catchment have proportionally more forest cover, fish tend to have more higher mercury concentrations because forests can increase the delivery, catchment delivery of mercury and organic matter to downstream lakes. And at the largest scale, if you will, uh, fish mercury can be influenced by climatic variables, and those are, include uh, temperature, uh, precipitation, wind currents, and these variables generally uh, influence uh, the position of mercury to aquatic and terrestrial environments, and also uh, mobility of the mercury through the atmosphere. So numerous variables interact to uh, influence mercury concentrations in fish, and as a result, fish mercury levels often vary among individuals, species, systems, and regions. And with no exception, fish mercury concentrations uh, vary among lakes in the Canadian subarctic, but little is known about drivers of fish mercury concentrations in, in the Canada's north, where fish, wild fish are a critical food source for local and indigenous communities. And that brings us to my study area, the Ditch region, which is located along the Mackenzie River Basin in Northwest Territories, Canada. Uh, the area hosts a number of lakes that are that provide sustenance for local indigenous communities and are just vital for their daily life. Uh, some uh, studies in the area shows that the mercury concentrations in resident fish tend to vary substantially among lakes, with uh, variability being up to sevenfold, but little or Almost no information is available about the uh, underlying mechanisms of the variability of mercury concentrations in resident fish. Uh, the lakes are environmentally diverse. As you can see here, catchment land cover composition, as well as uh, in-lake water chemistry variables that are known to influence uh, both fish ecology as well as mercury cyclings vary widely among lakes in the area. So here I try to provide a plausible mechanistic understanding of uh, how interacting processes at a scale ranging from individual organisms to whole catchment influence fish mercury concentrations in the Ditcho region. Uh, I focused on northern pike, a predatory fish species uh, with wide, of widespread commercial and subsistence importance. Uh, and that was the only species also that was also captured from all of the study lakes in the area. So my research goal was achieved using comprehensive biological, environmental, and geospatial data from 11 lakes in the study area. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on data analysis because of the uh, all the cause-effect relationships that I showed you that could take place between various ecosystem compartments to influence fish mercury. I developed a hierarchy of uh, cause-effect relationships. Uh, my hierarchical uh, procedure assumed that fish mercury concentrations would be directly influenced by factors that uh, play, that, uh, that act at the level of organism itself. And that included mostly fish ecology and food web ecology. 
and at the next level, these uh, what they called fish factors would be influenced by uh, in lake variables, and that is water physical chemistry as well as uh, mercury and methylmercury concentrations in lake water and sediments. And finally, these in lake variables would be influenced by uh, uh, catchment variables such as topography, surface area, and catchment land cover composition. And I investigated. Uh, I address this research question using a variety of statistical analysis, but mostly structural equation modeling. So in the first stage, step where I investigated relationships between fish mercury and fish factors, uh, I ended up with two uh, variables, uh, fish growth rates and uh, food web mercury, which together explained more than 83% of the among lake variability of uh, mercury concentrations in Northern Pike in the Decho region. You may wonder what about the relationship that you can see on B, but that is a confounded relationship that I uh, address comprehensively in another paper where I investigated uh, uh, fish growth rates and relationships between fish growth rates and food web fish, fish ecology, fish trophic, fish trophic, sorry, trophic ecology of fish. And so that relationship was compounded with the relationship that you can see on uh, C, uh, depicted on this panel C, uh, the relationship between uh, growth rates and mercury concentrations in fish. So in the next step, I developed a hypothetical meta model, which is what you see on the top panel, that aim to uh, unravel any possible interactions that uh, can take place among lake and catchment variables to influence the main drivers of fish mercury, and namely fish growth rates and food web mercury concentrations. And I then evaluated this uh, hypothetical network of relationship using a structural equation modeling. On the bottom panel, you see the final outcome of the model where numbers on the arrows shows the, uh, represent the nature and magnitude of the relationships. And those, by the way, those numbers are directly comparable. The higher the number, the stronger the effect. And numbers in the boxes shows the, uh, the percentage of among lake variability of any given variable uh, explained by its predictors or the arrows leading to each box. So uh, what I found briefly, of course, was that from the level of catchment, uh, the ratio of lake to catchment area, as well as catchment elevation and forest cover uh, affects uh, concentrations of organic matter and mercury within the lakes. And these variables in turn in, uh, decrease growth rates in Northern Pike and increase mercury concentrations in lake food web together leading to higher concentrations of mercury uh, in Northern Pike. I won't be able to go to more into details because of time, but in summary results, uh, reveal variables and mechanisms by and through which fish mercury concentrations uh, can be influenced in the Ditcho region, which improve the general understanding of fish mercury controls in northern regions. Catchment characteristics determined to be important determinants of abiotic and biotic conditions in downstream lake can be monitored remotely, such as by remote sensing. So results provide directions for future and future uh, manage monitoring and research uh, programs in subarctic regions where conducting research is uh, challenging and costly. It is however important to expand this or similar research uh, to more lakes and uh, resident fish to be able to uh, confidently generalize the findings. And with that, I'll end my presentation and thank you all for listening. Yeah, thanks, Mary, for the presentation, nice presentation. Uh, since we are a bit uh, uh, several minutes behind the schedule, so I think I need to move to the next uh, presenter. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, let's thank uh, Mary for the nice presentation. <laughs> thank you. Okay, and our next speaker is uh, Levi Snook. Uh, Levi is going to talk about Arctic railing habitat use and limitations in the uh, Kakisa River, Northwest Territories. Uh, Levi, floor is yours. Please share your screen and start your presentation. All right, sounds good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen here and launch the presentation. Can you see my screen there? Yes, we can. Great. Just going to swap this. Okay, so you can see that first uh, slide there. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to present um, 
by a research project, um, which is on the Arctic grayling habitat use and limitations in the Kikiza River and Northwest Territories. I'm uh, currently a master's student uh, with Wilfrid Laurier University, um, but I'd first also like to acknowledge all the uh, organizations and people that have contributed to uh, the work so far, uh, including Kagi 2 First Nation, uh, Decho Aram, Mike Lowe, um, and a number of other contributors, as well as my thesis advisory committee, including Deb McClatchy, Heidi Swanson, Derek Gray, and a number of people that have supported us in the field uh, so far. Um, so just a bit of background on the Kikiza River. Uh, it's a tributary of the Mackenzie River. Um, it flows directly into Beaver Lake, and although it's called a lake, it's actually just a widening of the Mackenzie River near the outflow of Great Slave Lake. Uh, the entire river system of the Kikiza is around 500 kilometers long. However, um, fish passage and access to upstream uh, aquatic habitats uh, for fish coming out of the Mackenzie River is, is really restricted only to a, uh, roughly a 17 kilometer stretch um, downstream of what's known as Lady Evelyn Falls. And it's about a 17 meter impassable barrier to fish. Um, bit of history about Arctic grayling on the Kikiza. The, the Kikiza River itself is a very popular sport fish uh, angling destination. Um, DFO actually carried out creel surveys in 19, between 1971 and 1984, um, just to get an idea of how much pressure was on the sport fish, in particular grayling. Um, they found that there was relatively high catch per unit efforts in those years. Um, but they did end, or end up reducing the catch limits in the 70s due to concerns of over, over harvesting. Uh, and then in 1989, there was a significant fish kill, uh, which occurred in Beaver Lake. Um, and that was determined to be due to high water temperatures uh, and subsequent establishment of uh, pathogens. Um, grayling numbers have since somewhat recovered, but spawning runs have still been inconsistent. And more recently, uh, Kagi 2 First Nation and other sport fish anglers have expressed concern about grayling, um, stating that numbers have declined over the last decade. Um, so just a, a brief overview of what we currently know um, about grayling habitat requirements, and this is from previous studies and uh, what's established in the habitat suitability indexes for grayling. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but essentially similar to all salmonids, grayling require relatively cold and clear waters to undertake critical life functions. Um, for adults, they have specific needs and requirements for water velocity. Um, they also have sensitivities to sedimentation and turbidity. Um, and they also seek um, relatively oxygenated um, spring fed pools for overwintering. Uh, and similarly with juveniles, um, they're typically found in shallow calm waters with little, little flow. Um, young of year inhabit shallow pools and, and slow moving water velocities. Um, and, and again, similarly, turbidity and, and sedimentation uh, plays a, a role in terms of distribution of fingerlings um, throughout aquatic habitats. And so uh, with, the, with that sort of established habitat requirements um, in mind, um, there's been some work in previous years around trying to identify potential issues that are causing this uh, potential decline in, in grayling. And a number of those include uh, sedimentation. So the, the concern here is that with um, melting of permafrost, as well as development of roads and, and culverts, that turbidity has, has increased in recent years. There's also the concern around barriers to fish and their ability to access upstream habitats to carry out things like spawning. As I mentioned, Lady Evelyn Falls sort of restricts access uh, to below a 17 kilometer stretch. Uh, and then also climate change is, is a considerable concern uh, with water volumes, particularly lower water um, and, and flow uh, sort of affecting spawning rising water temperatures, as I mentioned, in Beaver Lake, as well as potential lower oxygen and overwintering habitats, all from climate change. Um, so with those, um, with those potential issues in mind, there's been some recommendations for monitoring and research. Uh, and one of those, this is, came out of a report put together by Pete Cott, who's done, report, uh, done some studies and research on grayling uh, in, the, in the last number of years. Um, and one of those recommendations includes doing a tagging study, um, which 
is attempting to look at uh, where the grayling go, particularly outside of the spawn. So although grayling spawn in the Kikiza, they, they spend most of their life elsewhere, uh, likely in the Mackenzie River. So it would be helpful and important to know where and when uh, they're doing outside of the spawn. And there's also interest um, from, from others in terms of the timing of the spawn as well, and sort of what time they start to come back into the Kikiza from Beaver Lake and wherever else they, they inhabit outside of the spawn. And then the second component uh, would be to sort of start looking at other fish stages. Um, so um, looking at juveniles particularly and determine if there's habitat limitations in the Kikiza sort of limiting their ability to, um, to grow and, and to, to proceed to adulthood. So looking at rearing habitat and also trying to identify opportunities for enhancement. Um, so with those in mind, we, we pulled together some research questions to sort of guide the design of our program. And those essentially are, where do adult, uh, adult Arctic grayling from the Kikiza River spawning population spend their time outside of the spawn? When do grayling begin to enter the Kikiza uh, to spawn? What habitat characteristics influence adult Arctic grayling distribution? And are there limitations for juvenile Arctic grayling on the Kikiza River? Uh, this image on the right hand side shows Beaver Lake that sort of widening. Um, this is the Great Slave Lake as it starts to flow north and, and forms the Mackenzie River. This widening is what's known as Beaver Lake. And then this is Kikiza River uh, flowing directly in. Uh, and so the thinking here is that adult Arctic grayling distribution um, is influenced by turbidity, temperature, and DO. Um, and that juvenile grayling habitat is limited by uh, available rearing habitat because one particular feature of the Kikiza is because of Lady Evelyn Falls uh, at 17 kilometers, there is no other smaller tributaries that are flowing into uh, Kikiza between the falls and Beaver Lake, essentially limiting the, the availability of smaller tributaries for uh, sort of refuge and, and rearing habitat. Um, so we've Put together a sort of preliminary field design for year one. I uh, haven't mentioned this yet, but this is year one. We haven't, we've started to do some field work and I'll get into that in one second. Uh, but essentially year one is focused around the adult grayling uh, acoustic tagging program um, with the intent of tagging up to 75, 76 adult grayling um, using acoustic tags, which uh, send out a, an acoustic sound into the water um, and then deploying acoustic receivers throughout the system um, to sort of track and, and capture where those fish go. Um, and then simultaneously launching a number of habitat uh, loggers for, to record things like dissolved oxygen, um, turbidity and temperature, um, as well as gathering some bathymetry data and some discharge data as well from the Water Survey of Canada gauge on the, on the Kiza River. And so this image just shows a number of our locations for receivers for gating off um, the locations and trying to sort out whether or not they stay in Beaver Lake. Um, and, and if they do, where, where do they spend their time? And then for year two, uh, to focus uh, more on the juvenile habitat assessment, and this would be looking at trying to establish subset uh, locations of rearing habitat and assessing the viability for those locations to be used for rearing habitat. So um, likely going to be doing some electrofishing for juveniles um, and collecting some habitat parameters and to see what sort of influences. And uh, we haven't determined this yet, but there, we're thinking of establishing a, a uh, habitat occupancy model for that um, rearing study. And then obviously in, in year two, also continuing year one. Um, and so this is just a brief snapshot of the progress we've had to date. We've just started this project. Uh, there's been a number of delays over, over COVID, um, but this year we've got started to, to uh, start the project. And so right now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we completed the successful tagging of 76 adult grayling. Uh, we captured those between late April. Um, they were all captured with fly rods. Um, the surgical procedure used electromobilization, which uses a low voltage to anesthetize the, the fish and just to sedate them enough uh, in order to be surgically um, worked on. And then we implanted uh, Vemco V19 acoustic tags uh, that were less than 2% of the body weight, um, sutured them up and, and released them all. 
Um, and so far we have no observed or reported mortalities of those fish that we've tagged. So we're, we're happy there. And um, we also launched three receivers in the Kikiza River as well as some turbidity probes um, and DO probes as well. Um, and next steps, because of the timing of the year, we actually, um, we were there at a good time where the river was open, but- I'm sorry, Levy. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you finish your presentation quickly, please? Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, that's it. We're moving into the next steps, which is getting receivers out into Beaver Lake and, um, and moving on to some data collection uh, over the summer. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Levy. Uh, yeah, since we are a bit uh, behind the schedule, so we are going to move to the next uh, speaker. I'd like to thank Levy for the nice presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Please unshare the screen, Levy. And then our next speaker is uh, Yu Wei Xie. Uh, Yu Wei is going to talk about a uh, passive eDNA sampling strategy for Metazoan biodiversity assessment. Uh, Yu Wei, please share your screen. And then uh, please start your presentation. Flow is yours. We can uh, we can see your screen. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, this is Yui Xie from Classical Center of University of Saskatchewan. I'm the postdoc of Professor Chang KC and also the project manager of the EDN project. Um, first, I want to thank all our collaborators to support us fair sampling and um, uh, data interpretation. Uh, we. We all know that the biomonitoring is critical and essential for understanding the structure of the functioning of ecosystems. And the current approach to monitoring the, bio, um, uh, the biodiversity of ecosystems through field surveys uh, by physical connections and uh, the species and the composition of the committees are just be confirmed or uh, characterized by the uh, physical or morphological uh, identification. So uh, the enormous DNA isolate directly from water, sediment, soil, or air uh, can be used to amplify genetic barcode singulars um, for characterization of the uh, species list, community compositions, and ecological choice of uh, aquatic ecosystem and territory uh, ecosystems. And uh, there are a few roots of eDNA production, including the whole organisms like algae, bacteria, uh, and protozoa, and even the zooplankton. Uh, and uh, the shared and decayed cells from uh, larger or smaller um, organisms. And there are the free, cell free, ex uh, extra cellular uh, DNA uh, in the water. And all this eDNA in the environment can be degraded or absorbed to final particles and finally sink and the preservation in sediment. And uh, understanding the dynamic aquatic system are largely depending on the sampling scale and the frequency and active uh, sampling is time consuming and labor, labor intensive. For example, for water filtration, uh, we just can capture a snap a snapshot of the ecosystem um, uh, contemporary. And for sediment, because the decay uh, rate of the sedimentary EDA have a lower, is lower than that of in the water. So the sediment EDA can um, present a longer term record of ecosystem. So, um, I mean, uh, this is uh, an imitation of the current popular active uh, sampling, but how about the passive samplings, which is frequently used for pollution, uh, environment pollutants uh, monitoring. Um, here are two um, uh, recent uh, publications uh, about you to apply the passive sampling for environment biomonitoring. The first one uh, published on um, nature, uh, on, on nature, some, whatever, some, they're using just using the member filter uh, with or without charges to in situ filtration and capturing the UM DNA in marine waters. Another one is the natural matrix like biofilm to for the fish DNA um, metabolic coding and anyway, to detect fish fishes in the uh, in the freshwater ecosystems. Uh, and, but for our experiment design, uh, we want to compare other materials like uh, swabs. 
and uh, the jurors, we, which was probably uh, probably applied for the uh, involved chemistry analysis. And we also uh, to compare these two passive sampling strategies against the water uh, and a sediment scrub active sam uh, sampling approach. Uh, here's just some uh, brief uh, result from our pilot study. Uh, the overall metazone uh, biodiversity result from um, swap samplers are, are similar as that from the sediment and water samplers, but the community composition are different between passive samplers and water samplers and sediment samplers. It's because that the water samples are, uh, can, uh, include more uh, singulars from uh, zooplankton and zootophores. But uh, uh, however, the composition of the passive samplers are much are more closer to that from the sediment uh, result. Here's some detailed information about zooplankton biodiversity from both the uh, active sampler and passive sam uh, samplers. And he just confirmed that the was was samples containing more singulars from zone plankton assemblages, um, but the overall species nest, I mean the species richness between uh, swabs, water samples, the sediment samples are similar. And this is the um, brief result for the micro uh, invertebrates uh, biodiversity. Uh, we can see that based on the species richness, we can uh, all these three. Uh, Sampling approach have a similar uh, speed reach, but the GR power sample have a low, relative lower uh, species richness. And uh, we can see that the four micro invertebrates that the swabs uh, have a similar composition as wall samples and are further uh, a, a greater uh, differences between uh, from the sediment samples. And this is water rate uh, biodiversity. We can see that the swab and the water samples have a, a greater uh, species, rich, uh, species richness than jira and sediment sam um, samples. And uh, we also can uh, detect the amphibian uh, totals, and toads, and the fish singulars from all these three different uh, sampling approach. And uh, the swabs is kind of uh, close to uh, to the water samples uh, approach. Um, so um, just to give some brief um, conclusions. The passive EDA connections can uh, detect aquatic metazone as effective as EDA filtration and uh, sediment sampling. And it can provide similar estimation of the metazone biodiversity as what water samples. Uh, it may be a the passive sam uh, sampling may be a way to reduce sampling frequency and efforts of some pre-processing. And it may, may be a feasible way for remote site bounce away and pro programs. But uh, our current project is kind of pilot study and uh, there's still a lot of uh, questions remaining for to understanding the partitioning patterns of EDA in water uh, environments. And we need to certainly figure out how to adjust the compositional difference between different methods. But roughly just for the species nest estimation, the passive EDA is kind of um, as effective as, as other typical grab sampling method. So uh, it's a quick uh, presentation and thank you for, thanks all for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, thanks to you, Ray. Uh, actually, we are several minutes behind the schedule, so I think uh, uh, we can move to the next presentation. Let's thank uh, you for the nice presentation. And our next speaker is Nathan, Nathan Niall Hopper. And Nathan Niall is going to talk about evaluating eDNA meta barcoding uh, primer sets in silico for characterization of bonal pool amphibian communities within the Grand River watershed. Okay, hi everyone. Please go ahead. Everyone can see, it's all good? Yeah, we can, we can, we can hear you and then we can see your uh, okay, presentation. Perfect. Please go ahead. 
Um, so yeah, my name is Nathaniel Harper and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you today about choosing the optimal eDNA metabarcoding primer set with which to detect amphibian species communities within the Grand River watershed. There we go, okay. So the largest watershed in Southern Ontario, the Grand River watershed drains over 6,800 square kilometers of land into Lake Erie. Here, the resident human population is predicted to increase by at least 40% over the next 20 years. The resulting development and infrastructure needed to support this added population will increase pressure on our local waterways. As amphibians normally require high quality aquatic and terrestrial habitat to complete their life cycle, they're often considered the canary in the coal mine of environmental health. Specifically, the Grand River watershed contains almost 40% of Canada's amphibian biodiversity, totaling 19 local species. So conserving amphibian habitat within the watershed will help protect this vulnerable species group and our local waterways for future generations. One of the essential steps in amphibian conservation is the identification of occupied breeding habitat. Specifically, most amphibian species rely on vernal pools to successfully reproduce during the springtime. Unfortunately, visual or acoustic field surveys for breeding amphibians have a low detection probability, even for trained surveyors. So this presents a challenge in accurately monitoring amphibian species. Another method that can be used to detect amphibians and with potentially higher detection probability than current methods is the detection of eDNA or environmental DNA from a water sample. eDNA is a genetic material shed by organisms into their surrounding environment in forms such as skin, slime, feces, or urine. A simple water sample can then be examined for the presence of a DNA barcode that is unique to our target species without the need for visual or auditory surveys. We can go a step further and identify multiple DNA barcodes within a single eDNA sample simultaneously. So this process is called metabarcoding. Here, the detection of DNA barcodes is catalyzed by a pair of target-specific primers. This primer pair should have high affinity for the DNA from target multiple, species, multiple target species, as the primer set used dictates what eDNA is actually detected by the PCR. The products of the PCR reaction are then characterized by next generation sequencing, which identifies the various DNA barcodes present in the eDNA sample to species. Ultimately, the specific metabarcoding primer set that we use is a critical choice as a chosen primer set directly impacts the species specific barcodes that are ultimately detected. So a major challenge in applying this method to environmental samples is ensuring that our chosen primer set is targeted towards the amphibian species that we're interested in. Furthermore, we want to ensure that other non-target species such as ducks or squirrels, whose eDNA is potentially more abundant in a water sample from a vernal pool, are not targeted by our chosen primer set. So there are a couple factors that we want to evaluate to determine if a primer set can be um, appropriate for our use. First, we want to identify two conserved regions of the genome for each species of, of each species for our primers to bind to. As outlined here, these conserved primer binding regions flank the DNA barcode that's ultimately identified for each species. And we want these to be conserved regions because if there are mismatches between either of the primers and these primer binding regions, the chances of successful PCR amplification are reduced which in turn decreases the probability that certain DNA barcodes are ultimately detected. It's not always perfect, but we ran an analysis to see which primers match as close as possible to as many of our amphibian species as possible by retrieving the DNA sequence information for our local amphibians and aligning them with sequences of 11 different metabarcoding primer sets. So each combination of amphibian species and primer set was evaluated to see how well DNA sequences match the primer sets and the results are plotted here. A penalty score of zero is ideal as this indicates a perfect match between the primer set and the DNA sequence of that species. And even in the conserved regions targeted by the primer sets here, we can see that the matches aren't always perfect. Many of the primer sets were assigned low penalty scores for the majority of the target species. However, some others had numerous mismatches and were assigned correspondingly high penalty scores. So if a primer set contained a species assigned a penalty score over 100 represented here by the red line, it was excluded from further analysis 
As this penalty score indicates, the primer set in question didn't have a good level of affinity for all of the target species within the watershed, and thus might not detect the representative sample of what's actually present. All told, only five of the 11 primer sets that we actually tested fell beneath the threshold for further analysis, all of which are circled here. As this step didn't consider the effects of potentially co-occurring eDNA from other species that we're not targeting, a second evaluation step is also warranted. So in the second step, we evaluated computationally for each of our five remaining primer sets, um, the affinity of the, these primer sets for co-occurring but non-target species, so things that aren't amphibians. And essentially what we wanna look at here is how likely is our primer set to be distracted by DNA from species that we're not interested in, because this could result in detection of species that are actually present. So we want our primer region to bind to a region that's conserved in amphibians, but is variable in other species, so that we will detect amphibians even if there's a large amount of other eDNA from ducks, for example, that's present. And so this is shown here, the top where there's conserved areas that we're targeting in all the amphibians and unconserved areas that are then in these other uh, species so that we don't have very high affinity for. And to evaluate this, we again took the primer minor scores for all five of the primer sets which, which passed our previous evaluation step and assigned them penalty scores for other co-occurring non-target species, including duck, squirrel, and human. And then we compared the mean penalty scores of the, all the target species to all the non-target species for each of the primer sets. And we can see that while primer sets five and eight have some difference in affinity, primer set number two by far maximizes the difference in affinity between target and non-target species and is ideal for validation with actual eDNA samples. Thus, this has helped us eliminate the need for a lot of lab work by reducing our candidate primer sets from 11 to one. So to see if these predictions hold up to real world results, we'll compare results from primer set number two, which performed best here in silico with another previously published primer set to see how these results translate to real eDNA samples. In summary, eDNA metabarcoding primer sets should be thoroughly evaluated in silico against target and non-target species before use. By generating more efficient and reliable species detection methods, surveys can be implemented on a wider scale to assess and conserve the health of watersheds. I'd like to thank all the members of the Katzenbach, Servos, Doxy, and Craig Labs, um, our collaborators at the University, the University of Saskatchewan, and all of our funding partners. Thank you for listening, and if there's any time, I'll take any questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, completing, for completing the presentation uh, on time. Maybe one quick question from the audience. If there are no questions, then let me ask a quick question. Are there any particular reasons for selecting amphibian uh, uh, in your research? Well, there, um, it's sort of the, as I mentioned earlier, the canary in the coal mine. So if we can, if, if if we know that they're decreasing, then it's potential that there's other uh, environmental issues that are you know, present globally. So if we can conserve them, then ideally most other, uh, other vulnerable species you know, will be conserved also just due to the general protection of habitat. And everything. Great, yeah, thank you very much. So uh, let's thank Nathaniel uh, for the nice presentation. And our next speaker is uh, Sean. McLay. Uh, Sean is going to talk about indications of uh, benthic microinvertebrate assemb assemblage recovery fo uh, following wastewater treatment uh, upgrades. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a long title. <laughs> um, Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. My name is Sean. I'm a master's student at the University of Waterloo here just with under the supervision of Dr. Mark Seros and Dr. Adam Yates. And I'll, I'll just jump right into it now. Okay, so just to start, just a, a little a brief um, introduction into wastewater in a river environment. So effluent release from wastewater treatment can impact receiving waters through the input of substances such as phosphorus and inorganic forms of nitrogen. These inorganic nutrients can increase primary productivity, increasing the biomass of community members such as algae and causing eutrophication. This eutrophication can then increase organic matter decomposition and lead to decreasing dissolved oxygen levels. Upgrades to wastewater treatment plants can re reduce the output of stress-inducing substances into receiving waters, resulting in notable changes to water chemistry. However, it is not always clear if these changes in water chemistry are uh, translate to 
biota as well. That is to say, if these changes in water chemistry are ecologically relevant. So given this, how do we further investigate changes and impacts after upgrades? And one way to do this is through benthic macroinvertebrates. So these are also referred to as BMI and can include aquatic insect larvae, uh, clams, and snails that inhabit river sediments. And they're affected bioindicators due to their sedentary nature, which affords confidence that BMI found at a given location will reflect that location's conditions. They also have a relatively long life cycle, meaning that they will exhibit cumulative effects over an extended period of time. They're also important members of river ecosystems, playing part in nutrient cycling and decomposition. And they also feature a variety of different taxa with different responses to effluent stressors, with some being especially sensitive and some being especially tolerant to these stressors. And one such river that has been exposed to effluent stressors is the Grand River in the region of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. So that brings me to the study area. So within the region of Waterloo, there are 13 wastewater treatment plants. And you can just see its location in southeastern Ontario in the top left here and within the Great Lakes region in the top right. And of these 13 wastewater treatment plants, Kitchener and Waterloo are the largest that have received upgrades. And you can see their location on the bottom map here with the Waterloo wastewater treatment plant in the north and Kitchener uh, just downstream in the south. And that these have had their upgrades implemented over the past decade. So these upgrades were, uh, were targeting nitrification and were followed by pronounced reductions in ammonia concentrations downstream of effluent release. And this can be seen in the box plots here, just indicating the concentrations of ammonia within each year with the uh, black line just indicating the median value. And you can see a Kitchener just downstream of effluent release, you see that the uh, ammonia concentrations are relatively high until we reach the period of major upgrades during which there is a drastic reduction in ammonia concentration. This can also be seen in the Waterloo wastewater treatment plant. The ammonia concentrations initially increased due to as a result of construction, which reduced treatment to only partial nitrification. However, once that period of construction ended between uh, 2009 and 2014, you see that gradual reduction in ammonia concentration, followed by yet another reduction following those major upgrades in 2017 slash 2018. So given this change in the water chemistry, my research question was, is there a difference between benthic macroinvertebrate assemblages before and after upgrades were completed at both the Kitchener and Waterloo wastewater treatment plants? So in order to answer this question, uh, I used uh, BMI assemblage samples taken from six sites in the Grand River by the region of Waterloo, collected by LGL Limited, a contractor, and they collected uh, BMI assemblages from three different sites adjacent to each wastewater treatment plant, one upstream of the Waterloo wastewater treatment plant, and one downstream near, one downstream far. And same for the Kitchener wastewater treatment plant, one upstream, one downstream near, and one downstream far. And so these were all collected um, each year in the autumn of 2009, 2012, 2015, and 2018. And there were five replicates collected via server samplers and riffles for each year and within each site. And this was adhering to a backing design or before after con uh, control impact design with samples taken before and after upgrades to the wastewater treatment plants, as well as samples taken at a control site, which would be the upstream site independent outside the influence of the uh, effluent release, and two impact sites being downstream near or downstream far, directly under the influence of this effluent release. And I did multivariate analysis on these assemblages, of which I'll show a portion today. So just starting with the Waterloo wastewater treatment plant, looking at the NMDS ordination of benthic macroinvertebrate assemblages. So each of these points represents a benthic macroinvertebrate assemblage, with, site, with uh, points closer to each other being similar, and sites farther apart being less similar. And we can see that these are coded based on year and site, with site indicated by color, with upstream in blue, downstream near in red, and downstream far in pink, and the years in different shapes, with just 2009 shown for the time being in the diamond. And we can also see denoted some important events in the upgrade timeline, with that construction occurring between 2009 and 2015, and that major upgrade between 2015 and 2018. So as we can see, just looking at the upstream site in blue in 2009, we see that all the replicates are quite close together, which makes sense given that they're all sampled within the same year and at the same uh, site. And while we do see a bit more dispersion at the downstream site, we can compare these site clusters within years and see how their similarity changes between years in association with these upgrades and construction. So taking a look at 2012 now, in the triangles, we see the upstream sites and downstream near sites, the distance between these clusters increasing a bit which followed what would be expected given that reduced treatment as a result of construction. In 2015 in the squares, we do see the clustering getting a bit closer following the completion of that construction, indicating they become a bit similar. And finally, in 2018, we see upstream in circles and downstream near in the, uh, the red circles getting a bit closer, far closer than they've ever been in the record so far, indicating that these assemblages have become more similar over time in association with upgrades. Another important thing to note here 
is that each uh, the assemblages sampled within each year appear to occupy their own distinct portion of the NMDS, with 2009 in the bottom, 2012 across the middle, 2015 in the top, and 2018 in the top left. So just moving on to the average similarity for Waterloo. So this bar graph depicts the average uh, similarity as calculated by the inverse of break areas to similarity between the upstream and downstream near sites in red and upstream versus downstream far in the pink. And so the greater the value here, the more similar these two assemblages are, the lower the value, the more dissimilar. And what we see is that there is a reduction in similarity between 2009 and 2012 and uh, co-occurring with that construction. Then we see an increase in similarity between 2012 and 2015 with the completion of that construction. And finally, another increase in similarity following those more major upgrades, indicating once again that the assemblages are becoming more similar in association with upgrades. So we do see a more pronounced relationship at, between upstream and downstream near, likely as a result of its proximity to that wastewater treatment plant outfall, just being one kilometer downstream, whereas the downstream far site is five kilometers downstream. And now moving on to the Kitchener wastewater treatment plant, again, looking at an NDS of the BMI assemblages, with everything set up being uh, set up the same. However, the, um, the events are a bit different with the major upgrade occurring between 2012 and 2015, though there were some more minor upgrades between every sampling point. And here, a bit of a different comparison going on as we'll be looking at upstream versus downstream far as opposed to upstream down versus downstream near, as the contrast seems to be a bit higher between these two sites here. So in 2012, we see the upstream and downstream far site clusters getting closer together, indicating they become more similar following that more minor upgrade. Then with major upgrades in 2015, we see the upstream and downstream far sites becoming even closer. And then finally, in 2018 in the circles, we see the upstream and downstream far sites closer than ever before, indicating that the BMI assemblages have become more similar in association with upgrade. And just taking a look at the average similarity here, again, focusing on upstream versus downstream far, we see that the similarity increases between 2009 and 2012 in association with that more minor upgrade, again, increases following that more major upgrade and increases once more between 2015 and 2015. Again, indicating that the assemblages are becoming more similar in association with upgrades. And again, we see that it's we see the difference between uh, the Waterloo wastewater treatment plant with the more pronounced difference being the downstream far site, and this is likely as a result of historical oxygen sag, i.e., uh, oxygen depletion here, which was likely ameliorated by the uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. So finally, just wrapping up with some conclusions. So BMI assemblages do appear to be recovering following upgrades, with upstream and downstream sites becoming more similar. Recovery is mild and slow, but may continue as a, uh, due to timeline of upgrades and lag of BMI response as the uh, recovery time for BMI can take several years. And just based off that, some recommendations. Some, so continued monitoring is critical as further sampling may reveal that additional recovery. And it's imperative to retain this current study design as given that interannual variation seen, this vacuum design allows for the homing in on effluent effects by comparing upstream and downstream sites, which should theoretically be affected by uh, drivers of interannual variation similarly. Thanks so much for listening and thanks so much for GWF for having me. And um, yeah, feel free to contact me if you have any questions on my email. And uh, thanks so much. And yeah, thanks, John, for the nice presentation. So I think uh, maybe maybe one quick question from the audience. Very nice presentation. Thank you. If there are no questions, then maybe let me ask a really quick question. So kind of you mentioned about constructions and upgrade of the uh, wastewater treatment plants. What are the consequences of upgrade constructions like improving kind of nutrient removal or uh, upgrade uh, improving uh, COD or organic removal? What is right. the consequences? Yeah, we did see reduction in the CBOD and we the, the upgrades targeted nitrification, which means there isn't a reduction in the total amount of uh, like nitrogen based compounds. It's a, it's a sort of a transformation from more, um, from more ammonia to nitrate. So instead there's a lot more nitrate output, uh, which should reduce the toxicity generally speaking for other uh, you know, biota such as fish, uh, but could have kind of like some implications for, you know, primary productivity is uh, generally ammonia is a bit more energy efficient than nitrate for, uh, for those, you know, algae and such. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. So let's thank, thank you, Sean, you. for the nice presentation. Thanks so much. And our next speaker is uh, Laura Neary. Uh, Laura is going to talk about characterizing vulnerability of shallow ponds to climate warming across the uh, Uping Crane Breeding Range, Alberta, uh, Northwest Territories, a new collaborative research program. Perfect. Can you hear Laura, and see me? Yeah, I can hear you and then I can see your screen. Uh, flow is yours. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Laura, 
and I'm a PhD student at the University of Waterloo, working with Dr. Brent Wolf and Dr. Roland Hall. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a new collaborative research program entitled Characterizing Vulnerability of Shallow Ponds to Climate Warming Across the Whooping Crane Breeding Range. So the whooping crane in the picture on the left here is North America's tallest bird standing at 1.5 meters tall with a 2 meter wingspan. In the 1940s, the population nearly faced extinction due to habitat destruction in their stopover area, which is in the Canadian prairie provinces. Since then, many organizations like the Canadian Wildlife Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as farmers, have come together to protect and monitor the species. While the whooping crane still remains endangered, the migratory population has seen exponential growth in the last 70 years. The wild population migrate from the coast of Texas to a remote pond-rich region that straddles the Alberta Northwest Territories, and it's protected within Wood Buffalo National Park. The park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and contains two Ramsar wetlands, one of which that was where the whooping crane nest and breed, which is this picture here on the top right. Currently, the park's UNESCO designation is being reconsidered and could become downgraded to UNESCO World Heritage in danger uh, due to stressors originating outside the park, such as industry and river regulation, as well as overarching governance challenges. In 2019, the federal government released an action plan that outlines measures that will be taken to protect the outstanding universal values of Wood Buffalo National Park. And one theme within this action plan is related to the conservation of the endangered whooping crane, as well as their critical habitat. However, very little is known about this pond-rich landscape where they nest and breed in, their summer, in the summertime. One reason why there is little known about this landscape is because it's very complex and very remote. Access to this region is only possible using a float helicopter with extra caution as to not scare the nesting cranes. The ponds span a beautiful color gradient, as you can see, from a cream color to a fluorescent green, and are all typically less than half a meter deep. The cranes are known to nest in adjacent wetlands of the lakes in close proximity to bulrush for nesting materials, as well as crustaceans for food. Pond drawdown, water level drawdown of the ponds is thought to increase uh, predation of the whooping crane and pond level rise is, is um, linked to reduced hatching success of the, of the baby whooping crane. However, there is insufficient hydroluminological knowledge uh, to anticipate how climate change may alter this critical nesting habitat. And so to address this knowledge gap, We've designed a project that encompasses both spatial and temporal dimensions to address two broadly stated objectives. The first being to characterize current hydrological and limnological conditions across the nesting region. And so water isotope tracers will be used to identify important water inputs. Depth loggers will be used to record and log pond level variation. And a suite of water chemistry parameters will be used to characterize the limnological conditions. The second objective is to characterize the past conditions of lakes used by whooping cranes, and this will be done using paleolimnology. Uh, for instance, diatoms that are preserved in lake sediment cores will be used to infer past changes in the ecology and limnology of the ponds, and cellulose inferred lake water delta O18 will be used to infer past changes in pond water balances. So from the beginning of this project, in 2020, I believe, we imagined it to have a very strong collaborative component with partners from the government agencies, like the two that are listed here, as well as the natural stewards of the system. And so bringing people together and harnessing their expertise has been a priority of this research program. One major benefit of this collaboration was being able to obtain samples in 2021 amid the ongoing pandemic via online coordination with local Parks Canada employees who already reside in the small northern community of Fort Smith. They masterfully carried out an intensive multi-day sampling campaign collecting water and deploying 60 depth loggers over two days using a float helicopter. 
We are also very keen to build relationships with Salt River First Nations, Smith's Landing First Nation, and Fort Smith Métis this year, as we are now able to safely travel north. The combination of hydrological tools that were used in 2021 have helped to parse out the roles of various hydrological processes. Specifically, hourly measurements of pond depths and water isotope tracers collected in June and September have aided in determining the importance of snow melt, rainfall, and groundwater versus evaporation on pond water balances and pond levels. The map on the right shows the sampling approach that we took in 2021, which was a paired sampling design where one site was selected that was known to be nested upon in the last 40 or 50 years, uh, paired with a site nearby that was not a known active nesting site in the last 40 to 50 years. As well, a suite of water chemistry parameters were also measured at these uh, 60 lake sites. And the water chemistry parameters that were measured are shown by the vectors in the ordination plot right here. And so the key take home message shown by the immense overlap of the orange and the green ellipses, as well as what we've been able to glean from the water isotope knowledge and the pond level variation, is that hydrology and limnology do not actually seem to differ between the ponds that are nested upon versus the ponds that are not nested upon. This suggests that either the cranes are not limited by ponds, which would be a good thing, <laughs> or hydrology and limnology are not really the best predictors of nest site selection. Rather, access to nesting materials like bulrush or food sources may be more important variables that explain the species' presence. One interesting feature of the water chemistry data is actually the regional specific differences that we've been able to parse out, um, which really shows that some of these regions are receiving um, more a larger proportion of groundwater input compared to other regions. We've been able to use what we've learned through the paired sampling approach that was taken in 2021 to modify our sampling regime going forward to better align with project goal number one, which is to characterize the hydrological and limnological conditions of the whooping crane region. So in 2022, we will be sampling 63 ponds and five rivers across the two most densely nested upon regions, which are the Sass and the Cluey, that span a range of color and size based upon satellite images that were taken in 2021. We will also be collecting sediment cores from five to six nesting ponds to understand how they have changed over time. And in years ahead, we plan to expand this spatially comprehensive sa uh, sampling strategy to all of the regions in hopes to understand the potential influence of ongoing climate change on water resource vulnerability in this remote and important region of Canada. Lastly, the suite of approaches we will be applying to understand the hydrology and limnology of this pond-rich landscape could very well comprise a framework for a long-term monitoring program. And this project wouldn't be possible without uh, the funding agencies such as Global Water Northern Water Futures, a subset of Global Water Futures, NSERC, PCSP, CFI, and uh, the Wood Buffalo National Park Action Plan. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Laura, uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, maybe we have one or two minutes, so before yeah, really quick question. Any questions? Quick question from the audience. There are not, maybe I, I have a really quick question. I, I feel like this is like you mentioned at the end of the presentation, you mentioned that yeah, uh, uh, in, in these kind of long-term uh, research work. So, and then when I look at the results, it's been only maybe a couple of years. So, and I think maybe a couple of years is not long enough to do this type of uh, research work. So when you say long-term kind of, what is kind of approximate time Time, time, time duration is like 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. Uh, what, what, what is the uh, some time requirement for this kind of research? I'm just curious uh, because this is quite new to me. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's, uh, there's this massive lack of monitoring that happens across the North, right? Because of access and, and funding. But um, yeah, 2021 was the first year that 
we've actually collected any water or data from the ponds that the whooping crane nest in. So we're hoping that, you know, the funding that we've obtained can, can um, contribute to, you know, at least five years maybe of, of data and knowledge that, that could inform a potential inf um, monitoring program that's, you know, hopefully funding, funded by the government long into the future. So. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank Laura for the nice presentation. So this is the end of the session. So thanks for coming to the aquatic ecosystem session. The conference will continue to uh, two panel discussions starting at 1.45 uh, in Central Standard Time or 3.45 p.m. in Eastern Daylight Time. So have a nice day. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.